Again, my message is entitled, I Love My Church, You Matter to God. Now, this morning, I want to share with you some things I love. Not people I love, but things I love. Now, people who know me, the first thing you know about me is I love fishing. Now, fishing is a biblical sport. I will fish for salmon. I will fish for trout, perch, walleye, pike. You name the fish, and I will fish for it. Here I have a picture of me with the fish. This is a 30-pound salmon that I caught here in Ontario right out of the Niagara Falls River. As a matter of fact, it was just a couple of kilometers just downstream of the Niagara Falls itself. I love fishing. Now, something else I love is this right here. I love sand and surf. Now, some of you, you come from places like this, and you know how beautiful this can be. This is Cuba. I mean, I love Cuba. I love the sand. I love the sun. I love the surf. I love the people. I love the food. I love the culture. I love Cuba. I love the ocean. Something else I love is photography. I love nature photography. Uh, there are times I am out in God's great creation and I see scenes like this and it just I, I'm reminded of just how majestic and wonderful our God is. I love photography. Now, I also happen to like food and one of my favorite snack foods is McCain's Deep and Delicious Chocolate Cake. Now, I get it. It's junk, but it is the best tasting junk you will ever eat in your life. Now, please, don't be sending your pastor McCain's chocolate cake. I don't need it right now. COVID has been difficult enough. But I love chocolate cake, and I love McCain's Deep and Delicious. Now, there's something else I love. And before I share it with you, I want to acknowledge that, well, some of you, you love it too. Some of you, you're going to be happy to hear that I love this. And some others, well, you're not going to be so happy. But what is it? What is it I love? Well, I've said it today and I've said it before. I love my church. Now, I just don't mean the two churches I'm serving, Nepean and Carlton Place, but I love the global mission, the global movement that is known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I love it from the GC on down. I love it around the world. I love my church. I love the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But now, here's the thing. There are some people out there, well, they might think, well, I belong to a cult if they ever heard me say, I love my church. And I get it. I understand there are people out there, you're not a Christian, you're not a believer, and, and you don't understand how a person might love an organization, a movement like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I get that, you don't believe. But there are people out there who believe, who are Seventh-day Adventists who would run me out of town if they heard me say, I love my church. There are people who would tar and feather me. There are people who right now would have turned off their computer monitor or they've gone to another YouTube video because this idea of how dare I have the audacity to love my church. Now here's the thing. I can tell you I love fishing. I can tell you I love Cuba. I can tell you I love junk food like McCain's Deep and Delicious Chocolate Cake, but how dare I tell you that I love my church? I mean, what's with that? Now, understand, my message, I I'm not here today to beat up on you or, or, or to look down on anybody who doesn't love my church. I, I get it. There are some of you out there, you don't like the church right now because you got hurt. And I want you to know, I'm, I was there. I, there was a time in my life, I was a young man, and there were important people in the church, leaders in the church, who hurt people I love. They hurt me, and, and I couldn't reconcile that. I couldn't reconcile how a leader in a Christian church could behave that way. So you see, I ended up loving the Advent message. I couldn't deny the message, but I had no love for the church. And if that's you, I get it. This isn't, I'm not talking about you. I'm, I'm not talking to you in that sense of the word. I want you to know, I understand what it's like to get hurt and be angry. And that used to be me. But if you ask me today, I love my church. Now, some people look at me and say, well, of course you do. You're a paid employee of the church. And I get accused of that a lot. So let me make this clear. I've been a Seventh-day Adventist for some 45 years, and I've only been a pastor for 10, and by the way, I used to do this for free. I, I used to have a whole other career that used to pay a whole lot better than this. 
You don't become a pastor for the money. You do it because you love Jesus. And so you see, I loved the church long before I became a pastor. As a matter of fact, I became a pastor because I loved the church. So why do I love the church? Well, I love the church because Jesus loves the church, and I love what Jesus loves. Now, how do I know that Jesus loves the church? Well, look at this. It's Ephesians, it's 5, and it's verse 25, and I want to read it for you. And it reads, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Do you see how much Jesus loves the church? I mean, the Bible says that Jesus loved the church so much that he actually died for it. I mean, look at how much Jesus loves the church. Think about this. Jesus built the church. He died for it. He purchased it with his blood. He is the head of the church. The church is his body. He cares for the church, identifies it as his own. He strengthens the church, displays his wisdom through the church, and the entire book of Revelation was written to and for the church. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation is about Jesus and his church. But do you get my point? Jesus loves the church, and I love what Jesus loves. This is why Ellen White could write, The Church Triumphant. We should remember that the church, enfeebled and defective though it be, is the only object on the earth which Christ bestows his supreme regard. He is constantly watching it with solicitude and is strengthening it by his Holy Spirit. Jesus loves his church. But when I say that to people, to some Seventh-day Adventists, they think I'm nuts. And here's why. It's unfortunate, but it has become popular to hate on the church. Have you noticed this? If you don't believe me, then take a look at some of the offshoot ministries that call themselves Seventh-day Adventist. Now, here's a dirty little secret that the offshoots and some independent ministries won't tell you. You see, here's what the independent ministries and the offshoot ministries know. The moment they criticize the church, condemn the church or its leaders, offerings go up. And the moment they give praise or recognition to the church or its leaders, offerings go down. Now, how do we know this? Because former members of these groups have told us so. Anytime an offshoot ministry needs money, all it has to do is criticize the church and offerings go up. And I think that's a shame and I think it's a sin because it violates what James says about the use of our tongue, especially when it comes to our brethren in the book of James. You see, it is popular for some people to hate the church. And we have some people out there who are rather, well, we call them self-righteous. They're rather pious, and some of them are pharisaical. And these are the people I'm talking about. These are the people who hate the church, I think, for the same reasons Jesus loves the church. Let me say that again. The reason some people hate the church is for the same reason that Jesus loves the church. Now, if you're having difficulty with that thought, well, I want to share this with you. It's Matthew 16 and 13. It reads, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now here's where I'm going with this passage. Here's what you need to know about Caesarea Philippi. Anytime you read in scripture that Jesus is going somewhere, you need to sit up and pay attention because Jesus is making a point just by being in some of the places he was in. Now, what you need to know is that if the Jews had read, and when they read that Jesus had been to Caesarea Philippi, they would have fallen out of their pews. They would have said, really, Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi? They wouldn't have believed it. And here's why. Well, Caesarea Philippi was the northernmost city in all of Israel, and it was right next to the Assyrian border. And that's not the problem. You see, the problem is, is that this happened to be probably the most messed up evil city in all of Israel. Now, how do we know that? Well, Caesarea Philippi had a nickname. Do you know what it was? Its nickname was the Gates of Hell. Now, I mean, I want you to imagine that you're driving into the city of Ottawa, and, and you see the sign and it says, Welcome to Ottawa, you are entering the Gates of Hell. Or a sign that reads, welcome to the capital region, welcome to hell. I want you to imagine the most evil, wicked place you can think of on planet Earth right now. 
times that by 10, and you're getting close to Caesarea Philippi. Now, here's what you need to know. It took Jesus seven days to walk to Caesarea Philippi. That's seven days under the hot Mediterranean sun to make it to the gates of hell. Do you know what that tells me? It tells me that Jesus is not afraid of messy people. This is the messiest sinful city in all of Israel, and Jesus goes out of his way to walk seven days to go to Caesarea Philippi. Why? Because they needed him. Jesus is not afraid of messy people. And this is why some people hate the church, because they don't like messy situations, and they don't like messy people, and they don't like people who sin differently than they do. Now again, where do I get this from? Well, it's actually from Luke chapter 5 and 30. It's an encounter Jesus had with the Pharisees. And it reads, But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Now let me ask you, who were the scum? Well, they were people like you and I. They were people who didn't actually, well, behave like the Pharisees and eat like the Pharisees and worship like the Pharisees. And if you didn't act like the church in Jerusalem, you weren't a part of the church in Jerusalem, and they called you a sinner. Well, take a look. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to, to repent. You see, the Pharisees didn't like messy people. They didn't like messy situations, and they didn't like people who didn't look like them or act like them or even worship like them. And if you weren't like them, well, the, the belief was, well, if you're not a part of the church in Jerusalem, it's because you're not acting like the church in Jerusalem. And they didn't like messy people. And here's the thing. If that's you, you're going to have some problems with this church. And maybe one of the reasons why you don't like the church or you hate the church is well, maybe because of issues like this. What do you do with 1844, 1888? We argue over the nature of Christ, the nature of sin, the investigative judgment, feast days, new moons, and Sabbaths. Or how about diet, dress, music, entertainment, competitive sports, or even how to keep the Sabbath. And that's just some of the few messy issues going on in the church. And what we have are some people who look at these issues and they say, if you don't think like I do, and believe like I do, and dress like I do, and worship like I do, and eat like I do, well then you are not a part of the church in Jerusalem unless you look and act like the church in Jerusalem. But now here's the thing. Jesus didn't play this game. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't care about the rules in Jerusalem. What Jesus cared about was people, and that meant if he had to get his hands dirty, if he had to spend his time with messy, sinful people, well, that was Jesus. And if you have a problem with this idea, well, I want to encourage you to go over to Matthew chapter 8. And in Matthew chapter 8, there are three stories there where we see Jesus getting up close and personal with people in their mess. The first person we encounter is a leper. And what you need to know is that back in the day if you went to church, in Sabbath school or in church, they would have taught you that if you were a leper, it's because you had committed some sin and now God was punishing you for something you did to make him angry. But that's not all they taught. They also taught that it was God himself with his own very hand who would reach out and curse you if you made him angry. So here's this leper. He comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. But now here's what I want you to catch in this story. With his own hand, Jesus reaches out and he heals this leper. Now, here's what you need to know. Back in the day, you didn't go near a leper. I mean, you didn't talk to them. You didn't socialize with them. You didn't eat them and you certainly didn't touch them. And there were two reasons why. The first was, well, you didn't want to catch the disease, but secondly, you didn't want to interfere with the wrath of God. I mean, if God was punishing somebody, you certainly didn't want to help them because, well, you know what? They sinned and they deserved it. They're getting the wrath of God and you don't want to interfere with God because, well, then maybe God will curse you. And so you didn't touch them. You didn't talk to them. You didn't help them. But then here along comes Jesus, God in human flesh. And with his own divine hand, he reaches out. And not with wrath, but with love and compassion, Jesus reaches into this man's situation 
and he heals him because Jesus is not afraid of our mess. As a matter of fact, Jesus can take your mess, and if you let him, he can turn it into a miracle. You see, Jesus is not afraid of your mess. And some of you are thinking right now, but Pastor Bob, you do not know my sin. You don't know my situation. You don't know how bad I am. I get it. Jesus can turn a mess into a miracle, but you don't know my mess. You don't know my sin. And if that's you, well, go back to Matthew chapter 8. And in there you will find the story of a Roman centurion. Now here's what you need to know about the Romans. They were the enemies of God's people. They had murdered, they had butchered, they had raped, and they had pillaged God's people. And so here's this Roman centurion, and make no mistake, he was the commander of an army. He was the commander over a company, and I can assure you those men had been a part of the rape, the murder, and the pillage of God's people. And this man may have also had innocent blood on his own hands. And yet this man comes to Jesus, and he's pleading for his servant's life. And Jesus could have looked at him and said, no, you're too big a sinner. You're a murderer. you got blood on your hands. Do you know what your people have done to my people? Why should I help you? And Jesus looks at the man, and he looks past his sin, and Jesus looks into his mess, and he speaks a word of healing and redemption. Because Jesus can move past your sin and he can move into your mess and he can perform a miracle. Do you know why Jesus does this? Because God's grace is greater than your sin. And you need to know right now that if you have a messed up life, if you're struggling with sin, if you're having problems with victory over sin, Jesus is not afraid of your sin or your mess. He wants to step into your situation and turn your mess into a miracle by redeeming and restoring your life. Now, why would he do that? Because God's love for you has nothing to do with your behavior. It has everything to do with his character. You see, your behavior does not impact the love of God. God loves you, no strings attached. God loved you while you were an enemy of God. Scripture tells us while we were yet enemies, not perfect, not saved, not redeemed, not repentant, but while we were enemies, still in our sin, embracing sin, practicing our sin, that's when Jesus Christ demonstrated God's love for you and I because it has nothing to do with our behavior. It has to do with this one fact. God is love. And that's why we say at this church, people matter to God. People matter to God because you were created in his image. And when we walked away from God, God didn't walk away from us, but God stepped into our situation in human flesh and he offered up his own life to redeem us because people matter to God. And if you're a sinner, if you have a messed up life, if you are broken, you are hurt, you are lonely, you are lost, understand you're the one that Jesus came for. You're the one Jesus wants to redeem. Jesus is not afraid of your mess or messed up people. These are his people. These are the people he loves. I want to move on into Matthew chapter 8 here. And we read, And when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and waited on him. Here's what you need to know. Back in Jesus' day, it was a Mosaic law. It was a rabbinical law that if you were a Jewish man, you didn't allow a woman to touch you unless she was your wife, your mother, or your sister. Well, because women were considered unclean. But if you were a rabbi, you were a priest, or you were a holy man, you were a teacher of the law, you didn't allow a woman to touch you, especially if she was sick. Well, because one, women were unclean, and two, if she were sick or if anybody was sick, again, it's because they had sinned, and you didn't let sinners touch you, and how do you know they were a sinner? Because they were being punished by God. And so Jesus comes to Peter's home, and his mother-in-law, his ima is sick. And what does Jesus do? He walks in, and he takes a woman who is not related to him. He takes her hand. And he takes her by the hand and he speaks healing into her life. Why? Because Jesus is not afraid 
of our mess. So I'm running out of time. And here's where I'm going with all of this. This quarter, our Sabbath school lesson is making friends for Jesus. And you see, we can't make friends for Jesus unless we love the people whom Jesus loves. And Jesus doesn't love just the people who act and look and worship like the people in Jerusalem, but Jesus loves people who are messed up. He loves sinners. He loves those who are broken. He loves people who are far away from God. Jesus loves the people you hate. He loves the people who maybe hate you. Jesus loves everybody or he loves nobody. And Jesus gave his life for the world. And the reason I love my church is because Jesus loves the church and I love what Jesus loves. But the reason Jesus loves his church is because he built it for messed up, hurting, broken sinners who need the grace of God. And if we're going to grow this church and if we're going to make friends for Jesus, if we're going to fulfill the mission of this church to invite and empower both saints and seekers and sinners alike to become fully devoted followers of Jesus, we're going to have to love the same people Jesus does. And that means we're going to have to get our hands a little dirty. It means we're going to have to start liking people who don't worship like us, look like us, sing like us, eat like us, dress like us, or even smell like us. It means we're going to have to allow that God might be working in somebody's life differently than he's working in mine. It means that we're going to have to love people for who they are and connect them to Jesus and let Jesus transform their life. The question I have for you today is, do you love your church? Do you want to be a part of a church that truly loves people? the way Jesus loves them. A church that is not afraid of your mess. is not afraid of sinners. It's not afraid of people who look differently than us. And that we're going to be a church that's okay if sinners come here and they're still broken. And they're still wrestling with sin. They might have their sin on them. Are we okay with reaching into the lives of other people? Or are we going to be the kind of church that says, unless you look like us and act like us, you can't be a part of us. Because you need to understand Jesus doesn't play that game. And neither do we here at this church. Here at this church, if you identify as being broken or messed up or wrestling with sin or you're not the person you want to be or you're fighting demons you you don't even know how to address, this is the church for you. Let me tell you why I love my church. Because it is the church of Jesus Christ And the church of Jesus Christ understands that all of us are great sinners. It was John Newton who wrote the song Amazing Grace. And one day he said, I am a great sinner, but Jesus is an even greater Savior. And we understand that at this church. And at this church, we want to invite you to come. Bring your mess. Bring your sin. Bring your brokenness. And what we'll do is we'll bring you to Jesus. And Jesus will reach out, he will put his hand on you, and he will transform your life. I love my church, and I love that it belongs to Jesus, and I love the fact that the church is the instrument, instrument that God uses to heal broken, sinful lives. And so I love my church, and I want to invite you to love your church too. Why? Because people matter to God, And you matter to God. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner the church will grow. It's all about Jesus. It's his church. And we are his people. And we matter to God. Amen.